we did some exploration of the internet layer or the network layer, depending on what model you're talking about, the TCP IP model or the OSI model, we did some exploration of that internet layer last time. And we know that we wanted to pick up today with an exploration of the TCP IP transport layer. Remember what we said about the transport layer so far? We emphasized that this particular layer would be helping us send data reliably or unreliably through the network infrastructure. Now, something else that the transport layer does is it does session multiplexing. What does session multiplexing mean? Well, it means that you can easily have several instances of simple mail transfer protocol and post office protocol running. You can have many different instances of web browsers running. So we can be engaging in many different sessions, handed off from the session layer, by the way, we can be engaged in many different sessions all simultaneously. The transport layer also uses port numbers in order to distinguish where we are trying to communicate. So if TCP says, I want to communicate with port 80, this is for World Wide Web traffic. So the identification of specific, what we call well-known ports, and we'll say, we'll give you more information about that here shortly, that's going to allow us to identify the particular applications that we are wanting to communicate with. We know that segmentation is done here, and that's why we call the PDUs or protocol data encapsulation units, the data plus all the header stuff, we call them segments at this particular layer. And then there's flow control, right? There's flow control when required by TCP to transmit things uh, reliably. There's connection oriented communications when required, TCP handles that, and there's reliability when required. TCP handles that. So we've really just alluded to a very powerful fact here. There are TCP and UDP operating at this layer. TCP is unreliable and transmission control protocol is reliable. Okay, so those are the two main protocols used at this particular layer for transmitting information either reliably or unreliably. Let's drive this point home further by looking at this particular chart. So we have TCP on the left and UDP on the right. We call TCP connection oriented, meaning it is reliable. It's it's like, you know, it's like a phone call, right? It's like forming a connection with the other side and even having mechanisms for reliability, like, hello, are you still there? Hello, hello, I haven't heard from you in a moment, right? So there's reliability mechanisms built in. UDP, on the other hand, is connectionless, and it would be like dropping a postcard in the mail, right? I hope it gets there but we're not setting up that connection. We don't have mechanisms in place that can ensure that the communications are reliable. Notice transmission control protocol cares whether or not the segments arrive in order. UDP could care less. So where do we have TCP? Well, we use it in email and FTP, and we use it in web surfing, and UDP tends to be used in voice and video streaming. 
Now that really takes many people by surprise. They look at that and they say, are you kidding me? Voice and video being sent unreliably? I mean, don't we want good, solid reliability in those particular forms of communication over the data network? And the answer is, yes, we do. But we don't want the overhead associated with the transmission control protocol. Yeah, we don't want that overhead. We don't want any delay in the communications thanks to reliability mechanisms. Now, there's got to be some way, though, we can add reliability to this equation. Sure, we won't do it at the transport layer with transmission control protocol because of the overhead, but there's got to be some way we can build it in. Let me go ahead and just remind you about our blog. This is pretty coincidental, but if you go up to our blog and you take a look at today's post, okay, and today's post, the date today is, uh, for those of you watching in the recorded version, uh, well, actually, you know what? Why date stamp it? All you got to do is go over to the categories and click on the CCNA voice category. And there is a post I put up today from our expert here at stormwind.com, Terry Vinson, and he talks to you about the real-time transport protocol that's used in voice over IP networks. Yeah, sure enough, the real-time transport protocol is used in voice over IP to give us that reliability that we are missing with the UDP protocol. So UDP is utilized with RTP in order to give us the reliability that we lack with UDP. This video obviously goes deeper than you would need to go for CCNA. I'm not suggesting you watch this for your CCNA level of knowledge. I'm suggesting you watch it if you're interested in how this works uh, for just your own gratification, right? So UDP, transport layer of the OSI model. It foregoes reliability mechanisms. We therefore consider it connectionless. Doesn't worry about error checking. Doesn't worry about data recovery. Okay, its main concern is efficiency. It just wants to get the information from point A to point B as efficiently as possible with as little overhead as possible. So we remember that as the packet, as the data moves through the OSI model, we have this process called encapsulation where information is appended to the data as it's moved down the OSI model. I gave the example or the analogy of Tim Cook communicating with Bill Gates, and we talked about the encapsulation as that note was sent on its way. Well, what about the encapsulated information that UDP is going to tack on? It doesn't seem to me that there would be much of that. Right? Doesn't seem to me that there would be much of that encapsulation. And guess what? There isn't. Because it's not reliable, there's just a source port, a destination port, a length field, a checksum, just to make sure that when we put this header on there, we don't damage anything, and the data itself. Yep. Very little overhead, very simple. And I want you to kind of just really visualize this right here because in a few moments, we're going to show you the TCP header information and you're going to see, wow, a lot more overhead, a lot more going on. And that's because transmission control protocol is 
uh, going to give us that reliable connectivity. By the way, we are talking about TCP IP. And when they were naming that protocol, they recognized that transmission control protocol was going to be extremely popular and important at the transport layer. And IP was going to be extremely important and popular at layer three. How unfair for all the other protocols, right? I mean, this really should be called the TCP IP, UDP, SNMP, HTTP, FTP, ICMP, SNMP protocol. And I just left out a bunch. But no, when they were naming it, they said, well, transmission control protocol at layer four, uh, IP at layer three, and those two are going to be the main driving protocols that are used in these communications. All right, well, how about TCP's characteristics? Transport layer, of course, provides access to the network layer, of course, and it's connection-oriented. We call it a full duplex mode of operation because both sides are engaged in a connection when they are transferring information with each other. It does plenty of error checking. It does plenty of sequencing. It delivers things reliably. It wants an acknowledgement of receipt. It'll resend lost packets. It'll do flow control. I mean, it just does so much more. It's responsible for so much more than UDP. Well, sure enough, let's look at its header. And this sure does look substantially more complex than the UDP header. It's got source and destination port like the UDP header, but then it's got a sequence number so that tra uh, TCP segments can be ensured they arrive in order. UDP did not care about this at all. There's an acknowledgement number for the reliable acknowledging of the segments. There's length. There's some reserved fields. There's flags. There's a window size for something called windowing I'll teach you about later. There's a checksum. There's an urgent pointer. There's more options. And then finally, we get the data. Wow. Now remember, you can bring all this to life in your Wireshark, can't you? Yeah, sure you can. You can fire open your Wireshark and you can go ahead and you can capture packets, or in this case, we should call them segments. You can capture segments in your network and you can literally see these fields. Don't forget that. It's so remarkably powerful. So I'll go ahead and start a capture on a particular interface and I bet you we'll get both TCP and UDP packets captured. So we're capturing, capturing, capturing. And now I'm going to go up to the capture menu and I'm going to stop it. And you can sort by protocol. So I just sorted by protocol. So there's a bunch of ARPs, a protocol that we'll look at later today. There's the Dropbox LAN Sync Discovery Protocol. Look at that, because I'm using Dropbox. Dropbox apparently invented their own protocol for its operation. There's some HTTP. There's RTMP. And let me get smart here and scroll down. There's TCP. Aha, we've got some UDP. We'll double-click this UDP frame in order to bring it up. And look at this, the UDP header, and we didn't lie. There's a source port, a destination port, a length, and a checksum. That's it. If we contrast this to a transmission control protocol segment, and we look at the transmission control protocol header, yep, source, destination, sequence number, acknowledgement number, length, 
There's our flags field. There's our window field. There's our sequence field. So we can bring this information to life literally by examining these particular segments.